Hello and welcome to the Can't Pause This Podcast. If you're wondering about that glugging noise at the start of the podcast, Steve's an alcoholic now. Steve, tell us about it. <laughs> He's a tech mind in the <laughs> I think I'm supposed to be. I just got a new job in IT, actually. started last week. That's nice. Mm. Is that what brought on the alcoholism? <laughs> yes. As you currently drink right now. <laughs> I do currently drink right now, yes. Um, what, you want me to tell you about that? Oh, well, uh, I started a new job in IT. I can sit here sipping my coffee, judging you. Um, I'm now a junior test analyst at an insurance firm. The same insurance firm I worked at anyway. So that means um, I work on a team that fix bugs and like, amend software according to regulation change and company requests. And I test it before it goes out live, make sure it works, make sure it's bug free. So that's pretty interesting. Mm. Lots of databases and uh, I've got to learn how to code in C Sharp, which I've never done before. So that's pretty interesting. Okay. So how long have you been in this job? Uh, nine days. Cool. And you're a raging alcoholic already. Yes. <laughs> cool. So by pump that the IT crowd by that time schedule, in about a year, you'll be going with a pump action rifle, um, slaughtering all before you. Yeah. And what is it he actually says in uh, Fight Club? Got an AR-15 or something. Um, yeah, there's a lot. It's like your I mean, favourite movie, so yeah. you should know. <laughs> no, I haven't seen it in a while, though. But yeah, it's something like, you know, stalking from keyboard to keyboard or something. Mm. But uh, yeah, you, you can go postal, or there's a lot of uh, pop culture references we could throw in right now. But We'll be here all night. And talking about slaughtering your co-workers. Ooh. So. Also, don't want to get flagged on YouTube and arrested by the MI5. No, just a government disclaimer. Um, Steve will stick to heavy drinking. No random acts of violence. <laughs> no murder for me. Outstanding. Cool. Um, so we're here. Just a little bit of a catch up. It's been a while since we've done a a non interviewee podcast. Oh. Uh, I think Dan and George's Nintendo fight was the last one. That was a little quite a while ago. That was quite a few months ago. Quite a few months ago. They're still not talking. No, that's, that's fine. Probably <laughs> for the best. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> that's because George is away though. To be fair, well, yeah, but they're away though. Probably. <laughs> I wonder what he'll make of the carnage when he gets back. What of what we've done in his absence? Yeah, like we've got a Tory majority government. Trump's in power. We're still doing this. I think he'll be impressed Do you think? with all of it. <laughs> yeah, hopefully he's a bit of an anarchist. Or George. Yeah, mm. and an idiot. Yeah, yeah. He's not really an anarchist so much. Of it. He sends some abusive troll. He does some trolling on Twitter. Oh, and that's about the extent of his anarchy. Professional troll. Professional idiot. Hmm. I feel like that title has been taken by a comedian. Can you be paid to be either a troll or an idiot? Carl Pilkington. Sure. Point made. <laughs> so, in lighter news, uh, rather than talking about George. I, t- I can't mm. bear to, to dedicate an episode talking about George. Cause it no, I digress. Let's move on quick. Yeah. Uh, so, current news, and I think you'll be hearing this later on in this episode, or a product of my visit to London Film and Comic Con. So, I was there um, weekend before last. Geeking it up. Geeking it out. Geeking it up. Um, didn't go dressed up. It was a bit, you know, wasn't fitting in in that sense. No cosplay for Marcus. That's a shame. But it wait what a lot of people were. Thought you were gonna get that Harley Quinn outfit out. Fortunately not. That is a shame. Certain court restrictions prevent that. <laughs> but, uh... I imagine you saw quite a few Harley Quinns though. Very f- actually not as many as you think. Really? A few. Not many Deadpools either. This is surprising. Used to be a time you couldn't throw a stick without hitting a Harley Quinn or a Deadpool. <laughs> but no, quite a variety now of stuff. What was the standard of cosplay like? Good. 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 Saw an it amazing... was London Comic Con. It was, yeah. So, yeah. And they had like, they've really gotten into the cosplay thing. So it was a big cosplay stage, they did a uh-huh. co- competition. Uh, I saw an incredible, uh, you know, the whole Batman armored suit thing from Batman Suit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looked uh, immaculate, apart from the guy who had a beard. But uh. other than that, it you have the lighter eyes. Yeah. 
I think a guy I work with went. And he, I'm sure he took a picture of um, that guy, that Batman guy, like stood on his chest or something. It's pretty cool. So usually, I do sort of like of the really like amazing ones. Do grab a few pit, like say grab. I do ask first, but <laughs> uh, that court order. Take a few. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Um. Take a few pictures, but this time round didn't really have neither the time, and it was, and I can't overstate this, mentally busy on Saturday. Yeah, I bet it was. And I was only there Friday and Saturday. Saturday apparently was a sellout. Wow. And moving around. To feel like a sellout? Definitely, I think, felt like a sellout. Um, yeah. It wasn't shot well. The, in the guest area, it was nearly shoulder to shoulder. Um, the Olympia is like a massive hall. Mm-hmm. So the traders, you could sort of find a bit of room, but even kind of moving right. from one side to the other. And there was actually a queue for the staircase to get up and down. Jesus Christ. Th- th- that doesn't sound fun, man. Mm, it was okay. Um, Do you think this is the real reason Dan didn't go? More just cues. Yeah, just, he just washed out massive people. Well, it was it was a draw. It was a drawback to it. Um, but you kind of had to with the like they had a lot of big like Saturday was the first day of Benedict Cumberbatch and all those kind of guys. Did you meet Benedict Cumberbatch? I did not. I didn't even see Benedict Cumberbatch. He oh. moved like I imagine Jesus would, where it's like <laughs> couldn't see him. All could see a crowd of people as he went in. Went into his own private booth wow. so you can see him. And then I think I may have seen him leave, but all I could see was a crowd of people with their phones in the air trying to film. Paps. Well, they were not in paps. I don't know no, what, pe- was... what people were going to do with this footage of like, hey, check out that video of Bendit Cumberbatch leaving. <laughs> but I, I don't know. But there was a lot of big names. So it was going to be a bit busy. So you can't really blame them. Yeah. Can't yeah. say you didn't expect that. Nice to be. That's fair enough. Yeah, but otherwise, um, no, good. Um, yeah, plenty of well-known guests, and then there was like everything from your Kevin Smiths, Bendit Cumberbatches, and Natalie Dormers right the way through. So to your to, Marcus Woods, right through to Marcus Woods, <laughs> right down there, right at the bottom of the toe. So who did Marcus Wood get to speak to? Uh, so Marcus Wood got to speak to. I basically, I was kind of arrived midday Friday, so I was, and it was already in full swing. So I was like, oh, okay, better go in and do con stuff. Uh-huh. So I emerged from the lift, looked to my right, and sat there was Mark Bernarden. So for those who don't know, uh, Mark Bernarden was a film reviewer for multiple publications. Playboy was one of them. Oh, spicy. Um, did, I want to say the LA Times, but I might be wrong on that. The reason I know him was he is he's a co-host on the podcast Fat Man or Batman with Kevin Smith, which is one of my favourite <laughs> podcasts of all time. Fat Man or Batman? Fat Man on Batman. Oh, Fat Man on Batman. Yeah, cool. so, uh, it used to be like totally about Batman. And, um, it used to get kind of helped inspire us where yeah. they get a guest on, talk to them for sort of half hour, 40 minutes. Now it's a bit more about film in general. Um comic book culture pop culture really it's a bit more broad yeah uh mark Bernard's a very smart man um he knows he has a very intelligent take on film uh so i got an interview with him so cool. i hopefully i think on this episode we'll probably put that out so stick around and that should be on in a bit uh i got to speak to socal val so anybody who knows pro wrestling uh xtna and a variety of other organizations she's been in um very lovely lady and also, the one panel I went to was her, Victoria, and Axe and Smash of Demolition, who are getting on a bit, but still awesome and entertaining. Yep. So that was fun. Cool. Um, spoke to, so we had Ryan O'Sullivan um, on here a few weeks back, and we just got through, or I got through speaking to Dan Woz, who are both writers for Titan Comics. So I got to finally meet the Titan Comics brand manager and got to speak to him about ton of stuff that Titan Comics are doing. Sick. So we'll put that out in maybe a few weeks or something. Not too sure. Yep. Um, yeah, so I got to and also meet, like, unfortunately didn't record it, but a few writers. Um, had a couple of picks, so I put them up on my Twitter. Yep. One of them was uh, basically it's the Good Bad Movie Book. So it's a kind of reference guide to bad film. Kind of rates them out of 10. Fun book. And also the Dirty Colouring book, which I'm going to put on my Twitter as well. 
So I like kind of highlighting um, little fun things in amongst the sea of uh, Deadpool t-shirts and <laughs> um, other various merch, most of which is t-shirts. And what else do they have? It's like, it's usually a mis- mix mash of comics, t-shirts. At least there was comics there this time. They kind of, yeah, yeah. Showmasters have kind of embraced the comics thing a little bit more. Whereas at it, Comic-Con. At Comic-Con. Were they so, not embraced before at Comic Con? <laughs> uh, if you go to Bournemouth Film, certainly last year, um, the Comic Zone was basically two or three stalls. That's tragic. Um, mostly, yeah, it was very much a. a like the movies have taken over. Um, well, like the MCU. Yeah, kind games. kind of. Yeah, it's like they had a big old video game stall. You would have been happy there. I would have. Loved they had it, like yeah. a so a LAN. Local act, local network, yep. thing. They had one of those zones, a retro zone. That's cool. Um, they had like a one where it's kind of like so. It was like, I think the theme was individual controllers. So it was like a Guitar Hero, and then a like the old Donkey Kong drums, and like going on like that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's quite a lot going on for video game, and they got the space at Olympia, so they can kind of lay a lot on. So that's quite good. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was good. I had a good weekend. There was a couple of drawbacks. Um, one, the sheer amount of security around the guests, which I appreciate, like, they do need, or they, they all want, and especially given the amount yeah, of Yeah, it doesn't do a lot for, like, access to them, though, does it? Doesn't mean you can just... Um, I don't know. I mean, you're never going to, like... I don't mind that so much, and obviously I don't expect everyone just to be able to wander up to, like, bear in mind, like, Pamela Anderson and a lot of high-profile people. Yeah. I think it was more just the general, like, they looked like private security, like, suited up, didn't look friendly. Machine guns under the suit jackets. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, Pam, like, I had probably as much as the president. Pam, we have first name basis with Pam now. Yes. <laughs> I saw her for a second from afar. <laughs> that qualifies me to call her Pam. <laughs> I think it just gave, like, a very unfriendly view a little bit. Um, yeah. And yeah, we have recently had some pretty vicious terror attacks in London. Very true, yeah. So, and I get you're going to have a nutter lunge, and you're not going to want a couple of showmasters volunteers like yeah. for there for that. But combined with the fact that I saw that Mads Mikkelsen was charging sixty pounds for an autograph, I think it was seventy something like that. I some, from the picture, yeah, I think it might have been seventy even. Um, That's obscene. <laughs> yeah, that kind of the two combined did take the shine off a little bit. Yeah. Um, and but to be fair, I didn't actually kind of. I'm sure once you paid and got up to these people, I'm sure they were very nice. Mm -hmm. No reason to doubt that. Um, That was one thing. And this is more, the next thing was more of a personal thing. Um, So I've been to MCM, which is like the biggest, I think it's maybe joint with this one, but I think it might be the biggest in the UK uh, convention. That is too busy for me. Your shoulder to shoulder, (laughs) can't move, that sort of thing. Too much for me. A little bit shreddy. This, like, was another big one. And as much as they had, like, some panels, some of them charged, some of them didn't. Um, other than that, in the cosplay sort of stage, there wasn't a lot else going on other than buy stuff from the stalls or pay for autographs. Right. Um, I've been to smaller ones, so I'm maybe a little bit more used to kind of a lot of little things going on, it being a bit more communal. Right. And you kind of, like bit more interactive mm-hmm. so this was all a bit kind of okay i was there for two days and i mean i was there kind of doing a few sort of press stuff for us like talking to people and that sort of thing so i had mm-hmm. other things to be doing but i was also just a bit okay well i don't want to necessarily i've seen the stores i want to see and i've bought the stuff i want to buy and now i'm done with that mm-hmm. i don't want to pay for i'm not really a big autograph guy so i'm don't really want to pay for those no so a lot as well. Uh, well, that's like the top tier people. But so yeah, I was a bit like, okay, so that's that then. And again, it's so big, you can kind of wander around to your heart's content for a long yeah, time. Yeah, You're yeah. probably still missing stuff. But at the same time, I guess I'm just maybe, maybe I've lent a little bit more towards the smaller, friendlier, nicer kind of, at four o'clock, <laughs> yeah. this happens and at three o'clock, there's a quiz and then which there's a ton of across the UK. Really? Um, they're not hard to find. If like the SF ball I went to in February was a prime example, um, but there's a bunch of them for loads of different TV, film, mm. 
comics. I'm sure there's gaming ones yep, out there. there. Yeah. So yeah, um, I think certainly next year, if not this year, I'll hit up some smaller ones and um, yeah, see if I kind of prefer those and see what the differences are and, and that kind of thing. But you know, good time. Happy I went. Um, cool. If you're into your beer conventions and definitely if you're into your autographs and stuff, definitely hit that one up. So yeah. What have you been up to, uh, Steve? That's my story for the week. What have I been up to, apart mm. from starting a new job? Mm. Uh, drinking in a new job, we've covered drink, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been playing a lot of video games, okay. um, obviously. Um, but uh, I've been kind of getting ready, uh, planning some content for the channel. Because um, it's a pretty exciting month, really, um, to be a gamer. Uh, to be a PC gamer, especially, as I obviously am, as you've seen from the content on the channel. So... Um, the first pretty exciting thing is the, uh, the PC, uh, beta for Destiny 2. So Destiny 2, um, had a beta on console a couple of weeks ago now, um, which I did get the chance to play. Um, now it was pretty exciting. It's definitely, um, much more polished, much more refined than the first one. Very much the same though. Um, all the same principles. Um, I was surprised to find actually how adjusted i've got to um pc gaming performance compared to the console now um i'd heard rumors that once you got used to the um the higher frame rates um the higher resolutions that going back to those lower resolutions and lower um uh, frame rates on the console especially with the really narrow field of view that you get with destiny that you can get motion sick which i thought was complete codswallop until i played the destiny 2 beta over your keyboard no, I am <laughs> going to lull so hard. I didn't pop it. No. Oh just... no, it's too much. It's too much. <laughs> Someone get my hair. I'm not even kidding. About 10, 15 minutes into playing the beta on my sofa, because it was on the Xbox, um, I did actually start to feel a bit motion sick. Um, which, in a way, vindicated the huge amount of money I spent on this particular PC right over here. You um, sure that was what was making you sick? Yeah. Just no, no, it was. Yeah, just... <laughs> thinking about oh no this console only spent. costs 300 oh, pounds <laughs> <laughs> it's just as good as a pc oh. <laughs> but it did um it did still get me very much interested to play um the beta on um pc um there's so many differences between console play and pc play that we don't really need to get into now but mainly obviously um the graphics quality and um frame rate and resolution but also having that mouse and keyboard control on a shooter game that's meant to be played fast you have an advantage with a mouse and keyboard so um bungie the developers of destiny 2 are going to be releasing a beta on pc for destiny 2 it was supposed to be between the 28th and the 31st of august um it's now been moved back a little bit because they're going to be doing a bit more development on the beta based on the feedback that they got from the console gamers that got to test it earlier in the month which is great for pc gamers because it means the beta version that they get to play is going to be an even more refined more balanced version than the one that the console players got to get got to play um they're also going to get they we pc gamers are also going to get access to um uh, a new 4v4 multiplayer map called javelin i believe which is pretty exciting so none of the console players that played the um the beta um, and maybe captured it with capture cards and uploaded it would have access to that map. So um, I'm hoping as a PC gamer to get in early whenever the beta does go live, probably the beginning of September, um, and get some juicy 1440p footage of that recording and get up on our YouTube channel as quickly as bloody possible. Um, so you guys get to see it straight away. That's obviously not everybody's going to have the time or PC to be able to actually play it and test it for themselves so um i'll get that out as soon as i can um the other thing that's got me a bit excited at the moment um is a couple of the recent updates with player unknowns battlegrounds now our man dan has been playing this an awful lot um much to my upset i must admit because he plays it more than i do and he never records any of his <laughs> damn footage he texts me in the evening going oh dude you need to come online i just won like two games in a row oh my god and i'm like what did you record them are you gonna upload them he's like oh i forgot yeah, I know. <laughs> so, um, use your imagination, viewers. <laughs> just imagine what Dan is up to. Close your eyes. Um, and, uh... 
I have been playing it a little bit. I didn't want to saturate the channel with Battlegrounds gameplay, though, so I have not been recording and editing, putting up too much of it. Um, but there was a recent update that um, included some first-person-only servers, which is really, really exciting. So um, for those of you that haven't seen it or heard of it or seen any of our videos, Battlegrounds is a third-person-only um, battle royale game so 100 players get dropped onto an island from an aeroplane they pick up loads of guns other weapons and loot the game area gets smaller and smaller and smaller and you fight until the last man standing wins basically um, but that game mode uh, is not particularly balanced or fair when you've got the third person camera you get a lot of people just hiding behind rocks camping behind walls using that huge great field of view that you get with the third person camera to just basically look over the walls, look behind walls, look behind trees, rocks and things without actually revealing it themselves at all. And you get all these awkward Mexican standoff type situations where two players can see where the other are from the camera without revealing themselves and it just gets a bit tedious. So by having this first, player, first person only mode on some of these servers, um, it completely eliminates all of that. So if you want to actually peek around a corner or peek over a rock, you have to actually stick your player character's head out and make yourself vulnerable. Um, you can't be running out across in the open and constantly looking around you full 360 degrees. You can only look where you're looking, um, which makes everything far more risky. Really, really dicey, much more sweaty. I've only played a couple of rounds of it so far, um, just because new job limitations, we haven't really had the time. But um, it's looking really, really promising. Um, and it's great, again, from the developers of the game, listening to what the community want. I mean, I don't know if you guys following them on Twitter or Facebook, but they are really setting the new standard for how game developers should be developing an alpha version of a game by constantly keeping the community up to date with patches and hot fixes on an almost hourly basis, um, server updates, server maintenance updates, and they're really listening to what the community are actually saying about the game and what they want and implementing that as the game was developed. Um, I don't believe there was any intention to have first person only servers when they originally started developing the game, but the community asked for it so much, they've done it before the game's even finished. So absolutely awesome. Um, if you guys have got the game, I do massively recommend checking those servers out because it's a completely different experience. Um, all of the main elements like the infantry management, the shooting mechanics are all exactly the same as if you were just aiming down sight on a third person server, but you just can't look third person at all. Highly recommend it, especially on duo mode. Uh, you get a lot of situations where instead of two players just hiding in a ditch or hiding behind a rock, just waiting for the other guys to move, you get one peeking and you know, laying down some suppressing fire while the other one moves because the moment you actually look, you're actually exposed um, to incoming fire from well, not only in the 80 to 90 degrees or so that you can see, but the other uh, 217 to uh, 280 degrees. Uh, that you can't see. The mental maths. I don't know how I did that. With the drinking. Mm. It's, uh, Impressive. Yeah. So um, you can probably tell I'm pretty excited about that. I think it's uh, it's really really awesome. Um, I'm going to get some footage again recorded of first person only gameplay and get that up on the channel in the next couple of weeks. Hopefully, I can pin Dan down to a time where he'll leave his other friends alone and uh, come play with me for a bit, and then we can get some recorded because there's no squad uh, first person only servers at the moment. It's only uh, single and duo, so squad is up to four. Marcus didn't know that, so just looking at the blank expression. Yeah, I, like, I don't know what you're talking about. So. Staring at you, dribbling. Yeah, so exciting time to be a PC gamer. Um, yeah, that was what I wanted, wanted to say, really. Tell you, uh, I'm very been buzzing for that. <laughs> oh, mate, I'm so excited about it. I, I, I wasn't one of the people hammering on at the devs on Reddit or anything like that, but I did when I heard some people were. Well, I thought, actually, yeah, it'd be a really cool idea. That would probably completely change the dynamics and make it a more enjoyable game for many but there's no way they're going to do it and they did it's like holy crap that's amazing so nice. highly recommend it oh and i first i started playing doom for the first time about three years later however uh long since it is that that game came out but um the original doom no the the new one i was gonna say what the fuck <laughs> new one. i think got game of the year or something it was uh, huh? everyone was raving about it like, the best single player game has ever been made um shooter game but uh, I'm not that impressed. Oh. A little bit let down by it. Yeah. I'm going to get some flame in the comments for that one, I'm sure. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. 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 Try and invite uh, George can do some professional trolling. When's he back? I don't know. 
need, need to know basis, I guess. <laughs> I don't need to know, really. No, me neither. Cool. Um, so, we're going to kick into interview. Um, I think we're going to do the Mark Bernardin one now. I basically came oh. back from London with, like, several under my arm, like, recorded. So, yeah, we're going to do sort of one a week. Um, yeah, let us know what you think. If you want to hear more from people, if you want to hear more from Steve on gaming, if you just want to interact with Steve. Steve, I believe you're on Twitter. I am Twitter, yeah, at Skartaz, that's S-K-R, S-K-A-R-T-A-Z. Nicely done. <laughs> Uh, if you want to chat more movies, um, chat about the interviews we've done. If you've got any suggestions, people that we should get on within reason, please don't tell me we need Robert De Niro on. Probably not going to happen. Unless some excessive stalking does its job. Uh, <laughs> I'm on Twitter at the Marcus Wood. Other than that, check out previous videos because you'll see some gaming videos with Steve. You'll see some interviews with me. There was some podcasts we did that are a bit more like this, where we were having a little chit-chat about various stuff. There was Jodie's first experience of Star Wars. There's the general chit-chat. There was us watching Fifty Shades of Grey for the first time. Oh, Plenty of good stuff uh, in there. Watching it for the only time. First and last time, I guess. Well, it, oh, so bad. Anyway, we'll leave you with the interview. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Catch you later. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Hi Mark, um, quick question, Yes. I'll try and keep them brief, but uh, first one, I knew you off of Batman on Batman, um, are you writing for anybody at the moment? Other than... uh, I am working on a show called Castle Rock okay. for uh, for Hulu and Warner Brothers that J.J. Abrams is producing based on the Stephen King universe. We have the rights to a bunch of books and we're synthesizing the awesome from Stephen King into one television show. Um, that's a new story, it's a standalone story, but I guess to touch on various parts of the Stephen King universe. Okay. Real. So that's for Hulu? That's for Hulu, yeah. Cool. So that kind of method is like obviously not the traditional distribution method we've had TV before. Right. Is that a little like, easier to work with? Uh, you know, from, from the inside of the process, from a writing perspective, it is the same as regular television. It's the same as terrestrial TV in that there's a writer's room, there's producers, there's money that's being spent by the bushel load. Um, it feels like it's regular TV because the scale of it is big enough. Um, so yeah, I haven't noticed any sort of foundational difference between working for the internet than working for television. Uh, insofar as they're letting us do what we want to do and paying for it. So. <laughs> Can't get much better than that. Can't get better than that. Um, just bring it back around to like other people's films and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, what's been your like film pick of the year? It can be a blockbuster, art house. Uh, I will say that I haven't seen Dunkirk yet, and I haven't seen uh, Catherine Bigelow's Detroit yet, which I've heard is very good. But if I had to tell you right now what my movie of the year is, I think it's Logan with Get Out sort of like just beneath it, maybe. Okay. But th- those two movies that I saw within three weeks of each other in like late February and early March are still among the best I've seen this year. And the, the feeling I had watching those movies, um, especially Logan, which I didn't think you could invest me in the 17th <laughs> iteration of Hugh Jackman as, as Wolverine, um, but it ended on such a strong note. And Get Out, I had no idea what to expect and was so surprised by the movie itself like from both a technical perspective that that Jordan Peele is actually a very good filmmaker but even from a thematic perspective like I didn't I have never seen horror operate on that particular level before Um, so yeah right now they're 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 one and two kind of a common bond there like Logan was a superhero movie but it was like different yeah it was an elegy for a superhero more than it was like rah rah yay go and slice a dude it's you know, what's the last story you're ever going to tell with Wolverine, and what does that mean? Yeah, like, and Get Out was, yeah, it was a horror film, but, yeah. like, that kind of subverted kind of expectations a little bit as well. Absolutely, like, it, it, it dealt with themes and structures that are both familiar, in that, like, outsiders coming to a place they've never been before, but being able to talk about race in a way that American films don't really do, uh, to stare it in the eye and look at kind of what both bonds us together and keeps us separate at once. Um, 
and then make it thrilling and then make it fun and then make it uh, funny at times. I, I think it's an amazing synthesis of all of these things at once. I think that's like, if you're going to go and do kind of like a, a horror film or a superhero film now, it's like the key to certainly a really good film is make it a bit different to work. Like Deadpool was a, a different thing again. That was something people hadn't really seen with superhero before. Yeah. Logan over there, it's like, is that kind of maybe the key where there's so much coming out now with both horror and superhero? I mean, I think the thing to remember, I mean, and, and it's something that, that the franchise filmmaker forgets sometimes, is that every movie needs to be about something. Every film needs to have a point to it, you know, and, and Marvel has remembered that more than they've forgotten it, especially with the Captain America films. Like, it's, they're very much tracking the disillusionment of a hero over three movies and, like, what, what happens when you lose belief in a thing that you believed in wholeheartedly. You know, it's finding that theme beneath it and making sure that it it resonates with every scene within the movie. I mean, it's 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 almost as if some filmmakers forgot that that's what filmmaking is. Yeah. You know, that a movie needs to be about something. And when you find movies like Logan, which are about futility and about, you know, what it means to be tits on a bull, to be like, I just, there's no reason for me to be here. Well, how do I find value in that? How do I how do I do one last thing that makes a difference? And get out, which have, which which gets to be about relationships and and polarization and ostracization and all of those things while also being a crackerjack thriller. Like remember that you're telling a story and that story needs to be about something. I think that's where like I know everyone has their own opinions, like obviously DC films weren't especially strong coming out of the gate. Right. The Wonder Woman part may be a bit of a step up. That seems to have a bit more of a narrative and a bit more of a solid point to it. Yeah. The different thing. I, I mean, that's that for me is part of where the DC movies fall down, is that I don't know what BVS is about beyond B punching S in the face. Whereas at least Wonder Woman, I knew what that was. I knew why that was. I know what it means. I, I understand the thematic resonances beneath it. And I feel like they've forgotten why we love these characters. They've forgotten why Superman remains, you know, an, an icon. Why he remains the, the light on the hill. They've forgotten why Batman, you know, what drives that character beyond just being Batman. It's like, what does it mean to be broken? And what does it mean to be, like, stitching yourself back together like a self-made Frankenstein and setting yourself out every night to get broken again? Like, what is that character? And what is that story? That's what I want to see, and that's to date what they have shown me yet. But Wonder Woman, I get it. Like, I know what that is, and I know why that is, and I feel like Patty Jenkins and Aaron Heisenberg knew going in, here's the story we want to tell. Here's why it's important. Here's what the resonances beneath it are. And that's why that movie works. Even if, you know, the last act gets a little, like, floating ring of garbage in the sky. But at least up until that point, it, it argued for its own existence in a way that the other ones don't. Uh, last question to keep live from the start of Mass Over. What film, rest of this year, is there anything people need to go and see, you're excited for? I'm excited for Atomic Blonde. I haven't seen it yet, but I, I love I love those guys. The John Wick movies are among my favorites, and that kind of action just just strings a chord in my heart, where I get to see my actual actors punching and getting punched in the face. Um, Dunkirk, I can't wait for, um, and then Thor Ragnarok. Like I, I love the mixture of sensibilities that Marvel gets to do. I think it's somebody like Taika Waititi to make a superhero movie, which looks like a Buddy adventure, like yeah, come on, bring it. I'll uh, 